The previous video looked at internal parasites, and today we're going to look at external parasites, those that affect the outside or stick to the outside of an, a host animal, so usually uh, on the skin. So the first thing we can look at is ticks. I think we're all familiar with ticks. So they are small blood-sucking arachnids. So arachnids are the class of insects like um, your spiders and so on. Um, they're basically thick-skinned on the outside. Uh, they basically have an exoskeleton, that's basically what it means. So then, secondly, they have long mouth parts uh, that they basically suck the, suck the blood from, and their mouth parts are there to stick to the outside of the skin of the animal, and that could cause skin damage. So usually, why skin damage is then so bad is because it's going to lead to fly strikes. So strike, just the word strike just refers to a bad... Um, infestation of flies and a lot of flies basically affect the animals at one time so it can lead to fly strikes and also bacterial infections you can imagine if there's like an open wound left on the animal after the tick has fallen off then any other microorganism or anything can affect that wound thirdly um, the ticks they lay their eggs on the ground um, so the ticks flourish usually in warm and humid conditions so usually a place like Maclea would be good because we have a lot of rain here and also hot summers so ticks then are called vectors. So basically a vector is an organism that carries another microorganism inside of it and transmit that microorganism then to a host animal. So the vector just means it's a carrier of that disease causing organism. In this case, such a bacteria, but so and viruses. And then when the um, tick drops off and reattaches to a new host, it can then transmit this disease to a new host. So then, second to last, ticks can transmit diseases such as anaplasmosis, red water, and heart water that we have talked about. Um, and it may cause the death then of the host. So lastly, it also affects animals through the fact that it causes blood loss because the ticks, they basically steal all the blood of the animal. And this can also lead to anemia, so meaning um, wounds that do not heal and the blood clotting factor then is minimized inside the host. Secondly, it can cause weight loss in animals, especially if this animal has a large tick infestation, so a lot of ticks are on, on the um, surface of the skin of the animal at the same time. And then also the loss of body parts. So this is usually in extreme cases, so parts like your ears and tails can actually fall off. And again, why this happens is especially in uh, infestation, so if the ears have a lot of ticks on them or the tails have a lot of ticks on them, the ticks steal the blood, so meaning there is less blood supply in those body parts, and which means a lack of oxygen and obviously nutrients for those body parts. And then eventually uh, the tissue kind of dies away and then you lose those body parts. So again, just in severe cases. So what you guys then have to remember is there's going to be three life cycles and you have to be able to identify your ticks based on the life cycle they show us. So the first type of tick you get is called basically a one host tick. So as the picture shows, there's only one host over here, happens to be a cow. So the tick comes, um, it basically attaches to the cow, and then eventually it falls off, lays eggs, and in its entire life, one individual only has to attach itself, not to one individual, it can have attach itself to different cows, but the point being the host is a cow. It's one species. It attaches to one species in its lifetime, but it can suck the blood of, let's say, a hundred cows. Point being, it's the same species. So as the life cycle shows here, here is your host animal. The tick attaches to it. Um, it evolves and becomes an adult while they're sucking the blood of this species. Then when it falls off, it, it actually lays eggs and the eggs are laying on the, the ground or the grass. And then you have your uh, larva stage or nymph stage. And then this stage then attaches to your host animal. And again, as it is sucking the blood, it develops into a mature tick but only has one species as a host. So here we have our developmental stages for the tick. You've got the egg stage, nymph or larva, as they show here, either or, and then your adult phase. So what you guys also have to remember is they can ask you, identify this, okay, so one host tick, but then also based on this life cycle, give an example of one host tick. So your example here would be the blue tick. This is actually what the blue tick looks like. It's a very soft bodied tick, but 
uh, caution here when they give you guys a life cycle don't just look at the picture of a tick of this tick and then say ah blue tick because sometimes they show more than one host a two host or three hosts cycle and then they still ask but give an example and then you see this picture in that cycle it looks like a blue tick and see say the blue tick no look at the amount of hosts don't look at the picture of the tick Okay, please look at the amount of hosts. So this is a one host tick and an example of a one host tick is the blue tick. Then we have the two host tick. Here we can see there's a cow and here is a rabbit. So two different species and the tick attaches to uh, on different times on these two species based on the life cycle of the tick. Again, here they show this picture of it looks like a blue tick, but it's not. So the blue tick here is not an example. The bond legged tick here is an example of a tick that uh, is based or is basically a two host type tick. Okay, so in one year, the first year they say um, of the tick's life, it attaches to the first host, in this case a cow. Then it falls off when it has eaten enough, the body is full, and now it can lay its eggs. The next phase is larva. So the next year, the second year of the tick's life cycle, of the tick's life, it attaches to its second host, in this case, a bunny rabbit. So then the larva uh, becomes more mature and it becomes, in, in this case, a nymph stage. Uh, larva nymph, just an enlarged larva, basically. And then eventually they develop into larger nymphs or larva. And then they complete their adult stage again back on the first host. So you've got, again, your main host and intermediate host. Um, but basically, again, one, two, two different species, four hosts, different times of the life, in the life of one tick. So we have our stages, eggs, nymphs in the on the first host, and then your adult is on, okay, this is actually wrong, your eggs hatch, then you've got your nymph or your larva on the, okay, in this case, let's make it the first host, and then you find out that your adult on the second host, okay, first, second, in this case. Okay, so your example here would be the bond legged tick. This means usually these ticks, they are, have maybe a red body or a black body, and then their legs are two different colors or three different colors. That's why the legs are called bond. Okay, then we have a three host tick. So again, here we have three different species. Okay, I'm assuming this just means that either a cow or a deer can be affected, but this is seen as one host. Then you've got your second host and your third host. So in its first year, okay, here we have our eggs hatched, then you've got your larva. So the larva then attaches to the first host in its first year. The larva then becomes a little bit more mature. In its second year, it attaches to a second host, in this case, the bunny rabbit. Then these larvae become even more mature, not a larva nymphs, whatever. They become more mature and then they attach to their third host and become adults. Okay, so again, look at the life cycle, one, two, three. So a three host tick example would be the bond tick. Again, the bond tick looks a little bit different. Don't look at this guy and say it's a uh, blue tick. So it's not, it's a bond tick. And the bond tick differs from the bond legged because the body of this tick is literally bond, meaning it is uh, black or white or whatever, multiple colors on the body of the animal, not the legs. Usually the leg legs are one color. Okay, so then we have other types of external parasites. This one is called the nasal worm. Hence the name, we're looking at a worm and it affects the nose of certain animals. So here's basically the life cycle or the, this, they'll show you this picture or a similar picture and then ask you identify this parasite. Then you have to say the nasal worm because you can see in the picture, the nose area of this animal gets infected. I stress this because the next parasite is going to affect the rear end of the animal. But if it affects the nose, it's the nasal worm. So yes, even the nasal worm technically is a fly. Eventually when it becomes it's a, a, a worm stage, there's a pupa stage and then becomes a fly. But we don't call it by the fly, we call it the nasal worm because this tells farmers that that is the area where the um, animal will be affected. The nose area and it's the worm stage that basically affects the nose. So symptoms of this irritation of the nose area, the sinuses, and the animal will sneeze trying to get rid of this worm in his nose. So then there would be severe thick yellow nasal discharge. That's what this picture is showing that these gooey 
mucus is coming out of the nose of the animal. Then the shaking of the head because they're trying to get rid of the parasite and also weight loss because they're focusing on this thing and it's close to the mouth. They don't really want to eat. They, um, they feel uncomfortable. So then eventually they will lose weight. So the best treatment here, again, this is important, would be to dose the animal against this parasite and also to inject the animal with ivermectin. Ivermectin is amazing. So you can use it mainly for most um, problems that the animal may have, uh, for parasites anyway. Okay, so then you have your nasal worms, then you have your blowfly. So here they just show you guys a quick a life cycle. You do not have to know this, it's just for interest sake. Again, you've got your adult, eggs, larva, pupa, and then back to your adult again. Here we see what the blowfly looks like. They're actually quite, I don't want to say beautiful, but they're big and quite interesting with the iridescent colors, either green or blue. And here we have some eggs that um, the fly has laid. I think these are actually the larva stage. I oh, know they look like the eggs. Okay, so the eggs and then eventually they become larva. And here we have an infestation in, on the wool or inside the wool of some sheep. So basically where they affect, I didn't put a diagram here, but they affect the rear end of sheep. So if they ever show you guys a diagram or a picture or a life cycle of this parasite and they show that the parasite attacks the the butt area of an animal is the blowfly. So basically what the symptoms are for this infestation is skin irritation especially around the butt area and the animal is restless and anxious because they are uncomfortable and they don't know how to get rid of this fly. Then they usually bite or try to bite the area that's infected. They rub against stuff, they kick, they wag their tails to get rid of this uncomfortable feeling. So the best treatment usually for sheep is to clip um, the wool around the butt area because look at here uh, in the picture you can see it looks kind of blackish or brownish and that's because the feces and urine has actually stained the wool and that smell actually attracts the flies and then they want to go there they lay the eggs and then as soon as the larvae come out of the eggs the larvae start to eat away at the urine and the feces the wool and then eventually they start eating the flesh of the sheep or the animal that's affected and that's bad so by removing the wool around that area uh, it means that that the wool isn't there which gets soiled so there's no wool to get soiled and you keep the um, skin clean then tail docking that's actually why we find sheep with short tails farmers usually um, cut the tail off or allow the tail to fall off and that's so that again usually when uh, a sheep poops or pees it wags its tail so the tail gets soiled and because the tail is swishing around it's actually um, causing the urine and feces to spread over the rest of its buttocks area so if there's no tail the tail can't wag and the urine and feces can't spread on the wool so that's a good way of preventing it then also breeding and selecting sheep that are resistant to these fly strikes fly strike again a bad fly infestation and then dipping the outside of the body of the animal to get to deter basically the flies from coming closer. Okay, so other external parasites just quickly is lice. So the, <laughs> par uh, the, the life cycle here is just for interest sake. Basically what you have is the eggs and then you have like these larvae, like the young stages. They kind of look like the adults, but they're just young stage of the adult, smaller as well. And then you eventually get the adult. The lice itself is very, very small. I mean, you can see it on the finger of a person. They, they, luckily, we can see them with our naked eye, but they are very weird looking creatures and they're also very, very small. Okay, so if there's an infestation, how do we know? Firstly, they also cause skin irritation. I think this is on the tail of a dog. We can actually see that there's also these sores on, um, on the skin of the animal, the hair has fallen out. It's not a pretty sight. So skin irritation. Sheep themselves, they also start to rub against stuff and bite their skin where it itches. Um, pulled and clotted wool, especially around the flanks of sheep, so the, the, the wool will also start to fall out. Um, animals will be stressed and restless, and they'll also maybe have a lack of appetite. And they'll also be weakened because lice, like ticks, also um, suck the blood of animals. Then they also will have damage to their hides or skin, as we can see in this picture. Treatment based one is dipping. So on the outside, meaning pour on, so we put on the back of the animal, and that will deter the lice. And also insecticides, something like carpet dust, especially with dogs, you usually throw the carpet dust on the skin um, of the animal, and that actually keeps the insects away or kills the insects. 
Okay, then we look at mites. So mites themselves, <laughs> they are really alien looking species. They're especially what they look like and they are microscopic. We can't see them with our eyes, but they are really the weirdest creatures I've ever seen. So they also have the same life cycle as ticks. And this is very important when they cause severe skin irritations known as mange or sheep scab. So especially when the mites affect the skin of sheep, we call it sheep scab because it causes these scabby scales and sores on the skin of the sheep and the wool also falls out. And mange usually will be called when it happens to cattle or dogs and so on. Um, the, the skin irritation on the skin where the hair falls out and so on, we call it mange. So then also um, these mites, they can either be on the outside of the skin of the animal or they can penetrate the skin and also be right into the deep, they go into the deeper layers of the skin. So some symptoms, um, these sucking or the sucking cause, um, sucking of the mites causes irritation, results in infections, uh, the animal itches, scratches, bites it. Secondary infections can also cause inflammation and the thickening of the affected skin with loss of wool and hair. And also it, that the mites can easily be transmitted from one organism to the next if the two animals stand close together. Then the mites ju simply just jumps from the one host to the next host. So the treatment then would be dipping to getting rid of um, this parasite on the outside and also quarantine. The reason why quarantine is because these mites are quite difficult to kill and they spread quickly. Mites can actually, along with lice, they can jump very, very um, high and far. So it's easy to spread from one animal to the next. And quarantine, because again, the sheep scab especially, is very bad for sheep farmers if they've got this infestation in their in their flock you can also spread easily to other flocks on neighboring farms okay so basically your detrimental effects of external parasites why is this so bad generally any parasite or external parasite specifically for a farmer so some parasites we say can cause anemia and in severe, in severe cases death this is very bad for a farmer because he loses his stock or he can indirectly lose his money then secondly it reduces appetite to animals meaning the animals will become weaker and thirdly, parasites act as vectors. They as well can transmit other microorganisms and diseases to animals. Fourthly, flies can cause open sores on the skin of livestock. And we said those sores um, can actually also cause secondary infection. It can also be penetrated by other microorganisms. Then flies can also annoy animals, which is just bad if you only work with the animals and they don't focus on you and they just keep on thinking about this thing that's irritating them. Then also the quantity and especially the quality of wool decreases if you think of the sheep scab. And then lastly, um, it can also cause damage to teats and udders, which then can result in less milk being produced and also the cost of chemical control to well, increases if you want to um, medicate the animals to prevent these uh, parasites to infect the animals. It's expensive to use all the dipping um, chemicals. So here we basically have the last slide, prevention and control of external parasites. So yes, your dips and sprays are good to um, apply on the skin area of the animal. Then also contaminated pastures must be rested. Sometimes guys, they ask you guys, what, what can a farmer do to prevent these parasites but without using chemicals? The best thing is rotational grazing. So yes, as soon as your pastures are contaminated, you have an idea that there are any mice or lights or ticks in a specific area, avoid those areas. Don't let your animals go there, so use rotational grazing. Thirdly, cut the bushes and plow the affected areas. Okay, hopefully this will kill the ticks and also there won't be any food source for your livestock anyway if you cut bushes and plow the area and also keep poultry it's actually a good tip your chickens and so on near water holes or areas where you know there's a tick infestation because the chickens will actually eat them so it's a natural and um, bio friendly way of actually getting rid of your um, parasites then also practice good hygiene, meaning any equipment that's used, especially in milking parlors and so on in, with different animals or individuals. If you keep it clean, there won't be any lice or mites to spread um, within that environment. Then also allow controlled animal exposure to ticks. You actually want um, animals to be bitten by one or two ticks because that actually causes natural immunity against those ticks. Then farmers don't always have to dip the animals as regularly. 
then also prevent um, blowflies to prevent it breed smooth bodied merinos they mentioned here so any animal that usually has smooth skin the same thing can be said for certain cattle breeds because something like a uh, a Brahman or a Bonsmara has much sleeker, um, smoother skin or hair um, than, say, your Herefords. Herefords are again a European breed and they have thicker um, and longer hair. So again, your ticks find it easier to latch onto the skin of animals with longer hair. So have or breed smooth bodied animals. Lastly, keep your breeds of cattle that are more resistant to ticks. Don't actually keep animals <laughs> that are European breeds and can get affected by ticks more easily, especially in Africa. Okay, and that's basically it for this lesson.